All right, Dr. J.T. Wiles, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, man, so glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, today's conversation is uh, very important. I, I love what you teach, uh, the nervous system, heart rate variability, stress, what stress does to really destroy the body when it's chronically elevated. And we're going to get into a very important topic here. So for those who are watching and listening, yeah, we're not really going to discuss keto today, but this is... Um, not directly correlated to keto, but indirectly correlated. Because if you could really master the nervous system, it's going to upgrade your results with any diet, any nutrition plan. So I'm excited to get into this. And I want to get into that shortly, but you have a really interesting backstory. Like what is your story and how you got involved in the health space to begin with, Jay? Yeah, so it is an interesting one because I would say it's rather unconventional. Like my my whole story is kind of unconventional, which I, I like. Like at first I was kind of like, man, this just things seem like they're not as interconnected as what I'd like them to be. But that's just me trying to be controlling. <laughs> Whereas like sometimes <laughs> life just leads you down an interesting path. And the one that you may not have ever anticipated. And I think that's the beauty of life, right? So for me, I am a clinical health and performance psychologist. Um, so my background is in clinical psychology. So I did a master's degree in clinical therapy and then went on and did my doctoral degree in clinical psychology, um, did a residency in clinical psychology and clinical health psychology. And I've always been interested in health and wellness, but I kind of was on an interesting health journey um, that I didn't realize I was on until something hit me pretty hard when I was a resident. So I was working immense hours uh, for the Department of Veteran Affairs in a hospital setting um, as a fellow, which is kind of just commonplace, like fellows work a lot of hours, residents work a lot of hours. But I just noticed that like something was really off with my health. I was feeling an, an immense amount of brain fog, like I just didn't feel good. I was having like this weird tunnel vision. Come to find out I was exposed to unfortunate toxic mold, black mold. And it didn't just hit me, it actually hit all of the residents that I was working with. It was in the office in the hospital that we oh, were boy. in. And so after that, like I had, I know it was rough. Um, so we had an, a, a, like basically a remediation period where I kind of dove deep into the literature, into the health and wellness literature, which kind of led from one thing to another. Um, so it was basically my own health journey that led me into becoming interested in more or less health and wellness and integrative holistic health. But it was actually during my time, and this is also the blessing as well, uh, alongside the curse of black mold exposure, that when I was uh, a resident for the Department of Veteran Affairs, the one thing that I was exposed to uh, was a rotation in integrative health and integrative pain. And during that time, I was working with veterans who were trying to titrate off of opioid-based medications because they've been on them for a long time, um, they weren't effective, or they were seeing just major symptoms that we know go with the, some of the addictive properties of opioid-based medications. And so this pain clinic was intended to utilize a multitude of modalities to help these individuals, things like changes in nutrition, things like mindfulness meditation, guided imagery meditation, acupuncture, you know, physiological chiropractic care. And then we also did this thing called biofeedback. And I never really heard of it, or at least I heard of it, but didn't have a ton of exposure. And you have to remember, uh, this was kind of, I would say back in the day, it wasn't that long ago, but back before like the advent of a lot of wearable technology that was tracking things like heart rate variability. And we did something called heart rate variability biofeedback. And at first I was like, oh, this seems a little bit kind of like, I don't know, maybe woo woo. Like we're kind of just doing breath work that's, you know, objectively measured. And I'm like, I guess that's okay, but does it actually move the needle? And what we found, um, because we published studies when I was a resident there, it actually does move the needle pretty substantially. If we actually measure and have people objectively see changes in their physiology, we can reduce their subjective pain experience. I was super fascinated with this idea that we could measure somebody's nervous system response and use it more or less as a guide to help train them to regulate their pain response. So for me, it turned into this just like wild, like I wanted to study and learn everything I could about heart rate variability and biofeedback and how it relates to nervous system monitoring and functioning. And so that rabbit trail just led me down into specializing in the area of psychophysiology and becoming board certified in peripheral biofeedback and heart rate variability biofeedback. And then people just, I guess, more or less started noticing and that was my background and it was a cool niche area. And then you had products like 
Aura and Whoop and a lot of others that have heart rate variability monitoring built into it. And people had questions, which they continue to have questions of like, what is this metric? Like, how do I use it? And so I opened up my own consulting firm um, back in 20, that was 2018. And I was working with a lot of high performance athletes, uh, professional athletes, high performance executives and CEOs, and helping them to interpret their data from these wearables, but also learn how to regulate their nervous system through different tools and through different protocols uh, that was helping them again to enhance cognitive performance, reducing things like stress and anxiety and the effects of depression and other mental health concerns. And it was very effective. And then come 2021, uh, one of the guys who I was consulting with, um, who was a Silicon Valley guy, tech startup dude, uh, his name's John. He was like, Jay, is this kind of like all the tech that's out there? Can we like help solve a problem that's kind of like missing in this market, which is basically like a mental health wearable or platform? And for me, I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm not super comfortable with this. Like, I'm a psychologist. Like, I'm not a, you know, a tech guy. <laughs> like, I just use and integrate tech. And so he sold me on it and I was like, okay, let's do it. And that's when we founded Hanu, which is my company now. It's a digital mental health platform that uses uh, wearable technology to help monitor changes in the human stress response. And then we train resiliency through different practices. And the rest is kind of history. Here we are now, 2023, and Hanu is out in the market. People are using it. Uh, but yeah, it's a little bit of an unconventional pathway that I never paved for myself, and in, in my mind at least, but organically it was paved. And so now I'm excited to be able to come here and talk to you about all the all the fun stuff we're learning and how to kind of just integrate practical tools in, in your life to best manage your stress. I love that. I, I love that it led you down this path, which is, is so important to have this conversation to really understand the nervous system and how you could really make yourself harder to kill, more adaptable with the stress responses we have. Because as I'm sure you would agree, stress is not necessarily bad. It's only bad when you don't adapt to it. But if you could actually adapt to it, then you're actually going to get stronger and better similar to exercise. So Hanu is the name of your company, Hanu Health. What is the definition of Hanu? What does that mean? Yeah, you know, just like any good tech founder of a company, right? You want to say, what is the product that we're building? And then how can I find a word and maybe, you know, some obscure language, maybe even a, a dead language, which is like Latin. A lot of people go Latin, the Latin route. And we were thinking, okay, kind of like heart, cardiovascular system, nervous system, breathing. And so we got a thought of all these ideas. And then Chris, our other co-founder who is out of San Diego, California, big surfing area, a lot of Hawaiian culture where he's from, he started looking at Hawaiian words. And the Hawaiian word for breath is hanu. And we were like, oh, that fits. It's kind of our vibe, right? We're kind of a, a chill, breathing, like parasympathetic relaxation company. Let's go with hanu. So hanu is Hawaiian for breath, which is very fitting because the primary strategy that we use for nervous system regulation is indeed the most organic way of shifting your nervous system, which is breathing. Oh, that's great. I love that word. Uh, and if you think about it, so many people who are overweight and are mouth breathers or they're wearing a CPAP machine, they're actually have, they're having obstructed breathing, which is going to deplete their reserves. They're going to be in the sympathetic state and it's going to be hard to get deep sleep. It's going to be hard to raise the uh, heart rate variability. So let's start with the basics here. Heart rate variability. If you could just explain that in a way where for my audience can understand what exactly that means, how does that relate to the nervous system? Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share with you something that changed my mind. You know, I've been in the health space for 14 years, best-selling author of four books, and there was a health supplement that I was recommending and taking that I no longer believe in, and that is fish oil. I know this might come out as a surprise because fish oil has been touted as this anti-inflammatory, but I'm here to tell you fish oil is actually doing more harm than good. Check this out. It's estimated that 83% of fish oil is ranted on the shelf before you even consume it. Even the best fish oil in the world will go rancid when it is consumed and mixed with your warm body temperature and stomach acids. A study showed that fish oil resulted in four and a half months of cellular inflammation. Here's the study. It takes 18 weeks to reverse the negative effect of the incorporation of EPA and DHA from fish oil into the cell membrane. This study showed that DHA lowers cardiac mitochondrial activity in your heart. And this study showed in mice that fish oil was linked to cancer. It said, we found that 
mice develop deadly late stage colon cancer when given high doses of fish oil. More importantly, with their increased inflammation, it took only four weeks for the tumors to develop. So you might be thinking, yeah, but that's high dose fish oil. According to the National Institutes of Health, the average adult requires 7.2 milligrams of fish oil per day, EPA and DHA. The average capsule of a fish oil has a thousand milligrams. It's a super physiological overdose and it creates a lot more problems. So what is the solution? Number one, eat high quality fish one to two times a week. Or number two, what I do and what I recommend to my students is to take a high quality plant-based omega like pure form. I take this every single week. It gives you the derivatives and the building blocks for your body to make its own EPA and DHA. What I love about this company is that it's organic, cold pressed, it's nitrogen infused, so it is preserved. They are a sponsor of this YouTube channel and they've given you an awesome deal. All you need to do is go to purelifescience.com and use the coupon code BEN4 at checkout to get $4 off your capsules of Pure Firm. I'm gonna drop a link for that with the coupon code in the notes down below. Okay, let's go back to this video. Yeah, it's a really great question to start off the bat because heart rate variability is so ubiquitous, right? It's like every single wearable you get is like gonna have a heart rate vari variability measurement of, of some kind. And so understanding what it is at its core, um, both kind of like what it is as a metric, but then also what does that metric tell you is vitally important. So I always like to set the framework of explaining heart rate variability through the lens of what people probably already intuitively understand, which is heart rate. And let me be clear too, heart rate and heart rate variability are very different from one another. We can gain a good understanding by looking and assessing both of them, uh, the combination's amazing, but let's just say heart rate variability is kind of like taking a microscope into heart rate. So if you put on a heart rate monitor and you were to look at that monitor, and let's just say you see the number that says 60 BPM, which would be 60 beats per minute. Well, what that's really telling you is that over the course of a one minute time frame, your heart was beating at an average of 60 beats per minute, or in other words, every single second your heart was beating to make 60 beats inside of one minute. Now, intuitively, it's really easy to understand that. So on average, okay, 60 beats per minute in that 60 second cycle. Is that really what's going on though? Is it beating at a rate of once every single second? And the answer to that is absolutely not. And the reason being is because the heart doesn't operate like a metronome. In fact, it actually speeds up and slows down very, very quickly. There's a natural phenomenon in our body, it's an arrhythmia called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And this arrhythmia is not a bad thing. A lot of people, when they hear the word arrhythmia, they think, oh, like AFib or atrial fibrillation, which is irregular heartbeat that is caused by a dysregulation in the electrical output of the heart. Whereas this arrhythmia just means without rhythm, A, without rhythmia rhythm. And what we see is that across the respiratory cycle, so every time we breathe in and out, we see a, a really big shift, or we should see, I should say, a really big shift in heart rate, a speeding up as we inhale, and we'll explain why that is here in a second, and then a huge reduction on the exhale, so that big peak and valley of heart rate. So what that then means is that over the course of the span of 60 seconds, if someone has a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, then it's likely something like going from 40 up to let's say 80 and then back down to 40, or maybe more like 50 up to 80 and then back down to 50. And then it averages out in that window to be 60 beats per minute, but it's changing. And so then the question is, well, why is it changing? Well, it's changing because of a lot of physiological reasons. And then it's changing also for a lot of adaptive reasons. So when we think about heart rate variability and how that plays into that change in heart rate across the cycle, heart rate variability is telling us how well we are adapting, our nervous system is adapting across that respiratory cycle. So put very simply, heart rate variability is actually looking at the time changes or the variance, the difference between time in between each successive heartbeat. Because again, the heart doesn't operate like a metronome. So if it was 60 beats per minute, that doesn't mean that there was one second in between each heartbeat. 
No, there was maybe let's say a second and then half a second and then maybe a quarter of a second. And then it speeds back up again and slows back down again. What that's actually telling us, if we see heart rate variability increase, is it means that the nervous system is adapting. It is able to kind of process the information with its in, within its environment and adapt. So it is the single greatest proxy that we have right now for assessing the changes that are occurring in our autonomic nervous system. And as we see heart rate variability increase, so that's the direction it's moving, then that means the autonomic nervous system is more adaptive. You're in a more relaxed state, which, which has a, a slew of benefits. And then on the other end, if we see heart rate variability start to reduce, well, that means that there's some level of taxation on your nervous system. We could call that stress. And to your point, Ben, what you said earlier is that the stress component isn't inherently bad. It's actually inherently good, but it's the how often, how frequent and how severe that that component is turned on. That's really what's dictating whether or not that stress is problematic or it's adaptive. So again, when people think of heart rate variability, I want people to think of this is a number that is helping me to better understand right here in this moment or over this course of time, how well is my nervous system adapting or in how not so well is my nervous system adapting? Great, fantastic explanation. So the name of the game is become adaptable, uh, you know, do things to help that nervous system become adaptable, which I want to talk about some of your favorite tools to do so. But before we get to that, what are some of the dangers if your nervous system is not adapting well? If you have chronically low HRV levels, can it potentially lead to heart disease? Can it lead to a heart attack, stroke? What are some other conditions that this can lead to? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a really interesting one because when we think about heart rate variability, one thing to really keep in mind, um, and this is what I like to, to explain to a lot of people, especially if they, this is their first time coming across heart rate variability, is that heart rate variability as a metric doesn't typically operate like many other metrics, which have what we call like a normative basis of comparison. So what that means is, is like if someone were to take their blood pressure the reason why we have a threshold of 130 over 80 or what used to be 140 over 90 in order to indicate hypertension is because they've done massive amounts of studies where they've seen that people who cross this threshold have significant problems related to cardiovascular disease as it advances compared to those who do not. So we can say, hey, here's kind of the cutoff for what's quote unquote good and what's quote unquote bad. You know, we have other types of blood biomarker panels where we kind of have these thresholds, right? Where it's like, we want to be kind of within this range. Well, the crazy thing about heart rate variability is that it doesn't really work like that. And the reason it doesn't work like that is because there are so many competing variables as to why heart rate variability kind of is, is what it is that we can't, it's like comparing apples and oranges when we compare two people's heart rate variability to one another. So really heart rate variability is best compared, not as what is your static baseline number that you see on your aura score or your whoop score, but how, what trends or what direction are we seeing heart rate variability go in? Because a downward trend in heart rate variability is indicative that the nervous system is being overly active and is having a really difficult time adjusting and adapting to the environment that it's in. What does that mean physiologically? Well, that means that the heart is working harder and the cardiovascular system in general is working harder. The respiratory system is working harder. There could be potential dysregulation of what we call the HPA axis. So an over secretion of things like cortisol, norepinephrine or epinephrine. And we know that this can cause some pretty significant concerns re related to metabolic health. So you'll really like this, especially in the field that you're in, as we've looked at kind of the effects of stress alone outside of any caloric or carbohydrate or any type of food intake, what that can do to overall metabolic health and including monitoring things like blood glucose via a CGM. And it is incredible. If you ever have somebody who wears a CGM and is, let's say, they're, they're, they're not really taking in any food, but they're stressed and you look at what happens to their glucose, like it looks like they just ate a donut or yeah. like they ate some Skittles or something. Like it's pretty incredible that stress can do that. And that's because of the effects of cortisol and how what cortisol does um, to both insulin and insulin sensitivity, and then also what that does to uh, glucose sparing. It's, it's, it's a very interesting process to look at. 
So there's a lot of metabolic concerns that come alongside with seeing these downward suppressions or trends in heart rate variability that can lead to a slew of mental related disorders and physiological related disorders. A great book, if people have not picked it up yet, um, is, is Christopher um, Palmer's new book, Brain Energy, which is an incredible book about the metabolic theory of mental health and mental wellness. And we see this one-to-one -one crazy direct correlation between an overactive nervous system and how that can impair metabolic health and how poor metabolic choices can impair uh, someone's mitochondrial functioning and then therefore lead the difficulties related to uh, mental health and mental wellness. And so the answer to your question is, is like if we're not regulating our nervous system response and we see that through a suppression and heart rate variability, well, then basically it can lead to or, or certainly exacerbate any other types of physiological impairments and be a complete impediment to somebody's health and wellness. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, stress is that that silent killer when you're chronically elevating your cortisol levels, what it does for the glucose levels. I've seen that, you know, I've wore a CGM before and I've, I've had some mental stress and I see it go up and I see that with a lot of my students as well. Glucose follows cortisol and cortisol is not bad, right? Unless it's chronically elevated. Stress is not bad unless you don't adapt to it. So it's really finding that nice hormetic zone to be in to make yourself more adaptable. When you think about the nervous system, there's a gentleman named Dr. John Demartini. Are you familiar, familiar with his work, Jay? I am, yes. I love his work. He's a brilliant man. I've had him on the show a couple of times. And he believes every single disease, every single symptom is a result of an imbalance in the nervous system. Either you're too sympathetic or too parasympathetic, and the body is going to give you symptoms and eventually disease as check engine lights to show you you're out of homeostasis, bring things back into balance. So I, I agree with that theory. It makes a lot of sense to me. And would you say that the best way to gauge that parasympathetic, sympathetic balance is to look at HRV? Is there another way that we can do this as well? Yeah, so there are multiple ways to be able to do it, um, but they typically are more invasive, right? So if we had the ability to track changes in, say, let's say blood cortisol, then that would be a great mechanism to look at the effects or shifts and changes in the human stress response. But that's a quite invasive way to do it. The other way would be looking at overall brainwave functioning um, and changes in brainwave states. That could be an effective way. But again, are people going to wear, you know, <laughs> EEG caps around everywhere. Yeah. Not maybe likely. Ben, Some people might be to do it, but not do that, right? <laughs> yeah, he he would do it. Knowing him, he would absolutely <laughs> do it. Uh, but you know, it's it's so for us right now, we're like, well, we actually have so much evidence in the scientific literature that right now the single greatest non-invasive way to have a proxy of nervous system functioning and nervous system balance is to use heart rate variability. And, you know, a lot of people have been tracking it, you know, via great wearables like Aura or Whoop or, you know, Garmin or whatever it may be. And the one problem though, is that they're simply just looking at it overnight. And yeah. that's a good thing in one sense, but in another sense, what we're not capturing is the most stressful aspects of their life, which is for most people, not typically when they're sleeping. That's a great recovery, stress-free zone, unless you got insomnia or some sleep problems. So I don't want to step on toes there because that is problematic for people. But what I will say is that for most people, it's understanding how do we self-regulate the nervous system throughout the day? Because so many people have their nervous system attacked throughout the day. It could be small little things or big things, and it compounds over time time. And if they're not aware of what's going on, and then certainly if they're not regulating their response during that time, well, that's when we see the buildup of a slew of different problems related to mental and physical health. So that's why, like, for instance, at Hanu, we wanted to create a solution, which was tracking your stress response at all time. It's operating kind of like a hawk looking at every little nuance of heart rate variability component throughout the day continuously. And then when we see something that doesn't make sense, uh-oh, nervous system is taxed, then we're going to alert you and say, hey, something's going on here. Now let's check in. Are you stressed? Like is something in your environment triggering this stress response, whether it's a work meeting, a commute, cognition, or thinking, whatever it may be. And then let's pair that. Let's condition a new response. Let's regulate because so many people get stressed. And then what's the behavior that comes? Well, something typically maladaptive. 
you know, grabbing some sweets or processed foods, um, yelling or externalizing their behavior. Uh, maybe it's shutting down and socially isolating. Whereas we're saying what we can actually do is condition our nervous system to respond in a different way that's much more adaptive and it's going to make you happier. It's going to make you more content and it's going to ensure that you have good work and family life relationships. So all of those are, are really kind of at the core of what we teach is like, let's monitor it throughout the day so that we can become more self-aware of our stress and how it's impacting our physiology. And then let's do something about it through self-regulation. Yeah. Heart rate variability. I, I agree. It's so important to get a device that tracks it. And for years I've worn, you know, the aura ring. Now I'm wearing your device and your device is a little bit different. It's not a ring. It's actually a strap, like kind of like a heart rate monitor strap. It's polar as well. And then the app shows you in real time, what exactly your heart rate variability, variability looks like and your resting heart rate. So I'm looking at mine right now. I'm on your app. I have your high new health strap on. And it's showing my heart rate variability is 10 MS, pretty low. And my heart rate is at uh, 104 because I'm excited about the conversation. So give me feedback on what I'm seeing here right now. Yeah, so you can see my heart rate's around like 80 right now. And then my heart rate variability is uh, hovering around 14, 15. So it's, it, it's, it's around the same range. Well, one of the things that we have to think about too, and this is something that I tell people all the time, is that when you you cannot compare your nighttime score let's say with your daytime score and here's why when you are sleep that is the most rested time and hopefully the time where you are fully recovering so the amount of stress on the body physiologically and even psychologically should be relatively pretty diminished but when you get up and you go throughout your day, when you're in an active, great discussion like we are, when you are utilizing and mobilizing energy, you're going to see a pretty big suppression in heart rate variability compared to those overnight scores. So don't be concerned. So like, you know, I just mentioned to, you know, my heart rate right now is around like 85. HRV is around like 17 right now. So for me, like just as a frame of reference, not as a basis of comparison for anybody, my HRV overnight is typically right around 100 to a 110, 115. Wow. Uh, right now, I'm mobilizing a ton of energy. So I am you know, excited. I'm amped up. We're talking. We're having fun. For me, there is a level of physiological stress that's occurring in this given moment that I'm not going to experience when I'm asleep at night. So then that would beg the question, well, like, okay, then what are we looking for? And again, it's all about directional movements. It's all about trends when we talk about heart rate variability. If I were to say, hey, let's just take a one minute snapshot of your heart rate variability right now, would that tell me much? And the answer is not much. But if I had a bunch of those over time or I had it continuously so I could see the peaks and the valleys, the ups and downs and ins and outs, well, that's going to tell me a lot more. It's the same thing with like glucose, right? If I sit down and I take my blood sugar and I see that right now it's 72, does that give me much information? It does give me some, but what if I start tracking it for, you know, let's say continuously or I could track it every single day and I'm kind of have a basis of comparison. Well, now I'm getting more data points. So what we do in Hanu is our whole goal and mission is to monitor your stress response by saying, where's your typical range? Where's your typical zone? And we say, we call that a baseline range. So we find, okay, what's Jay's, you know, kind of top average? What's Ben's top average heart rate variability? And then what's the bottom average heart rate variability? And then the whole goal behind our app, the level of gamification, which is training resiliency in the nervous system, is saying actually not like how high can we make HRV, but how stable can we keep HRV? And if we do have that directional shift, we see heart rate variability drop below our baseline. Well, then what can we do as a mechanism to regulate the nervous system, bring it back within its baseline range, and then offer ourselves a little bit more stability? Because what happens then is that a lot of people, they get stressed by something, they'll fall outside of their baseline range and stay there for a while. Well, what does that actually mean? What's going on when someone gets stressed and they fall outside of their heart rate variability baseline range? 
Well, now we're seeing HPA dysregulation. We're seeing cortisol secretion. We're seeing high heart rate. We're seeing all of these things that we know are not going to aid in longevity, health, wellness, and both mental and physical health and wellness if they continue to have happen. But what if we could prevent or at least catch it a little bit earlier and then self-regulate? Well, then we can diminish all of those negative effects that we're seeing and we can feel a life that's a lot more content, a lot more peaceful instead of kind of being stuck in this ramped up sympathetically fight or flight driven mode. So that would be kind of the whole idea. It's not saying like, how can I get my HRV up at my aura score? It might be impossible for you to do during the day because you have to mobilize a lot more energy. So your sympathetic nervous system needs to be more engaged throughout the day. That's a good thing. Or you might just be sleepy and kind of laying around all day, not doing anything. We need that level of activation. But what we do not need is the constant hit of really high heart rate, really low uh, heart rate variability to the point where we're knocked out of our baseline range and derailed for some period of time because we know that has really bad ramifications. Okay, so let me get this straight. So if I'm looking at my Aura HRV, the goal would be to get a baseline, look at trends, and over time increase that nighttime HRV. But with the Hanu device, you're saying not necessarily want to increase your HRV during the day because naturally you're going to be going through your stressors, et cetera. You just want to be able to adapt to that. So you want to just look at those trends, the averages, the low averages, the high averages, and, and look at that, not necessarily get a total, uh, not necessarily increase your HRV during the day. Is that Am I saying that correctly? Hey, I want to just interrupt the video you're watching real quick to share something with you. As somebody who's been in the keto space for 14 years, I've taken thousands and thousands of people through a keto protocol. I've seen the number one problem and struggle people have on keto being this electrolyte dumping process. Allow me to explain real quick. When you lower your carbohydrates and lower insulin, you're going to release excess water weight, which is terrific because you're going to look lighter, less puffy, and feel lighter. The problem is this, the kidneys also release excess electrolytes and you go through this sort of diuresis process leading to symptoms on keto. And what is the solution? Keeping your electrolytes up. And when I talk about electrolytes, there are good ones out there, then there are optimal, incredible products. The one that I use is from Upgraded Charge. One of the reasons why I love this product that it has a unique proprietary blend of nanoparticles that have the ability to get into your cells, which is for maximum absorption. It contains magnesium, zinc, sodium, and potassium. And it tastes pretty good. Kind of tastes like a non-alcoholic margarita. And the flavor comes from the lemon peel. Simply use this by adding it to your water or sparkling water and get your electrolytes up. Replenish them. This is key to feeling incredible on keto. Upgraded Formulas has hooked you all up with a sweet deal to get their upgraded charge or any of their amazing products at 15% off. All you need to do is head over to upgradedformulas.com and use the coupon code KETOCAMP at checkout and get 15% off your entire order. I will drop a link for you with the coupon code in the notes down below. All right, let's get back to this video. Yeah, yeah. And, and the one thing that I would, I would mention here is that when we identify that our nervous system is really experiencing taxation, in other words, in non-scientific speak, our body's experiencing stress. When we drop below that threshold, the best thing that we can do is pair that dropping or that taxation of our nervous system with a new adaptive behavior through something like biofeedback or breath work or meditation or some other approach so that then we can take it from underneath our baseline to maybe even in the moment raising our heart rate variability way above our baseline. And then after that practice is over, the goal would be to drop back down into a stable baseline range. So it's like, got the dip, we've caught it. Now let's do something to raise heart rate variability substantially. And then once we're done with that practice, heart rate variability will stable back out between our in between kind of the confines of our baseline range. So it's all about regulating stability as much as possible. Just like with, you know, uh, if you're wearing a CGM, you want to avoid just a crazy roller coaster throughout the day, the ups, downs, ups, downs, ups, downs. We kind of want to do the exact same thing with heart rate variability and find more stability or again, when we inevitably experience stress that is going to drop us outside of our range, it's not about having those never happen. Like That's an impossibility. We're going to experience those periods of stress throughout the day. 
but it's catching it a little bit earlier and regulating the nervous system a little bit quicker that is going to reap the most benefit for people from a physiological and a mental health perspective. Yeah, that makes total sense. Okay, so let's talk about how I would do that, how I would view that in, in this app here, right? So it's going to give me real-time data, but it's also going to give me trends. What else am I... What, what else can I look at with this app to see if I'm adapting well or not? What, am I, what should I pay attention to here? Yeah, there, there are a couple things to pay attention to. The first would be that, that yellow number for me, which is 65, which means that my body's experiencing a little bit of stress. It's not in the red zone, but it's, it's pretty close to there. That's, that's called the stress resiliency number. It's a zero to 100 number that basically takes all of your data and plots sit on a zero to 100 scale. So people who are familiar with Aura or Whoop, you know, you have like the readiness scale or the recovery scale that Whoop has, and it's that zero to 100 number that you get it once during the day after you wake up. And then that's kind of it for your day. Ours works differently in that it modulates or changes depending on changes we see in your data. So if someone says, oh man, it's just a lot of data. I don't really understand how to interpret heart rate variability. That is a great number to look at because what your goal is, is that if you can get yourself above that 80 threshold, 80 to 100, which is like our green zone, that means, oh my goodness, your nervous system is super primed between 80 and 60. That's like, okay, you're managing, you're, cover, you're recovering, you're adaptable, but just be kind of cautionary. When you drop below 60, that's like the, uh-oh, like the nervous system is really feeling it right now. It's time to really engage in some practice. So that's a good gauge to look at is that stress resiliency score and just kind of watch it over time. It's really funny. Like if you see mine that I, I've put here, uh, you can actually see that at the start of our podcast, I was over a 90. And then as the mm -hmm. podcast has gone, I've dropped to around 65 right now. And it's because again, like, you know, we're in a really highly engaging, my heart rate's higher, HRV is lower than what it typically is. And you see the stress resiliency score going down with it. And you can see that it follows heart rate variability pretty closely. You can see heart rate variability going down. And as it goes down, like the stress resiliency score goes down as well. If there are any aura lovers or users here, which I'm one of those individuals, uh, we also have a lot of stuff within the my data section of the app that can kind of, it looks very aura-esque. And the whole idea is to kind of fill the bars. So for instance, like with heart rate variability, like we show you the time above baseline. And what we really want to aim for is spending about 15% of the time we wear the device or throughout the day above our baseline. We want to spend about 70% of the time within our baseline range. And then time below our baseline range, we want to limit it to below 15%. So for me, for instance, today, time above baseline has been 21% of my time. So a pretty good day there. Time within my baseline range has been 54%. So a little bit less than 70, which is where I want it. And then time below baseline has been 25%. So I've had a couple of times today where the nervous system's really taken a hit. So like this morning, um, I see like around 7 a.m., my HRV was dropped pretty significantly. And then uh, around 1130 or so, it was the same thing. But I caught it, the app alerted me, and then I did some breath work practice to raise my heart rate variability significantly above baseline. And then when it regulated back, it's, it's staying pretty stable. And that's because the nervous system, I've trained my nervous system so much that it will listen to me when I tell it to move. That's awesome. I love that. So if you're a data geek, like this is a fantastic thing for you to have. I love that you have the stress resiliency score because if you're not a data geek and you just want to have the algorithm, algorithm figure it out for you, you just look at that. You said if you're between 80 and 100, like you're good. You're adapting. Your nervous system is rock solid. If you're below that, you have some work to do. So just look at that score. So it depends on how much you want to use the app. There's a lot of cool things in there. You mentioned breath work, right? And I think it's important for us to get into that conversation and maybe we could do some some exercises right now and I can see what it does to my HRV because a lot of people are going to be punched in the face by life, right? Life's going to hand their stressors. But if we could adapt to it with something as simple as like a couple of things we can do in a couple of minutes with breath work, uh, oh my gosh, what a great free tool. So can we do some sort of breath work exercise and see what it does to my, my HRV here? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what, what I'll kind of preface it with is that, you know, breath work is an evidence-based practice. I mean, the way that we incorporate it into our application, uh, we refer to it as biofeedback. So biofeedback is basically kind of the clinical objective form of breath work. It allows you to be able to watch what is happening in real time to your physiology. And again, the idea is to watch the trends. So am I moving heart rate variability in a direction that allows me to um, take control of the nervous system. Basically, is the nervous system listening to me when I'm telling it adapt? And again, that's through the change of respiratory rate. So when we change the mechanics of our breathing, when we change the, the pace or the cadence of our breathing, our nervous system like gets that signal via the vagus nerve. So our 10th cranial nerve or the vagus nerve is going to hear your cardiovascular system speak to it through resonance saying, I am in a safe, secure environment. I am changing my physiology accordingly. And so now I want you to adjust. Like if I'm safe and I'm comforted because I can slow my breathing down and change my mechanics, because obviously I wouldn't be doing that if the mountain lion was chasing me, then we see this reflected in an increased heart rate variability. So the way then you would do it in the app. So if you click the train button on the bottom, and then you'll see all of the exercises come up. One of our bread and butter exercises um, is the evidence-based uh, protocol of resonance breathing. And resonance breathing is essentially breathing at a rate that resonates with what's called your baroreflex mechanism. So your baroreflex mechanism is your body's natural innate way of maintaining blood pressure homeostasis. So basically a balance of your blood pressure. So basically we have these receptors um, in the aortic arch of our heart and in the carotid sinuses of our neck. These are stretch receptors that when there's a change in blood pressure due to us manipulating it through breathing, or if uh, the body just naturally senses that there's a problem, it will regulate in the direction that it needs to. So if it stretches, indicating blood pressure is high, will actually will shunt um, what's called acetylcholine to the heart via the vagus and will actually slow the heart down to reduce blood pressure. And the opposite will happen if it notices really significant low blood pressure, it will actually uh, utilize epinephrine and norepinephrine to increase heart rate and increase blood pressure. But we know that through breathing at these resonant rates, we can actually stimulate sensitivity of that baroreflex mechanism to regulate blood pressure during times of stress. So this is why uh, for those who have hypertension or high blood pressure, biofeedback has been found to be a very efficacious treatment for that. And then the coinciding thing that comes along is that people feel in, immensely more relaxed. They feel more um, uh, kind of at peace. And a lot of it has to do with how we've regulated their blood pressure. So I say we do some resonance breathing. Yeah. So if you just click resonance breathing, um, uh, you know, we'll just do a short one for the for the sake of here. We can just kind of stick it at, at one minute and then yeah. you can just kind of subjectively kind of rate what your stress level is. And then once you start the exercise, uh, for people who are watching on camera, uh, you'll just kind of see like this bar that's kind of helping you to stabilize your heart rate. And then all you're going to do is follow the pacer. So as it expands, you'll inhale. And then as it turns different colors and folds back in, you exhale. And what you might start to see is kind of these mountains start to form in your heart rate, kind of an increase. Inhale and then exhale. Those mountains are the changes in heart rate that occur across the respiratory cycle. I'm trying to do this while I also talk, so we'll see what happens with my heart rate variability. But my nervous system is listening to me right now, which is great. All right. And then at the end, it will just have you subjectively rate kind of where you are right now in a stress level. So hopefully that was de-stressing so I can move the slider up and then you get this report card. And as you can see, like that, that graph right there shows what happens to your heart rate variability. So even though I was semi-talking, I was still regulating my breathing during that time. My heart rate variability went from uh, 13 to start to 20 to end. That was a 54% increase. And you can see that on the graph there. 
and then it peaked out at 25 milliseconds. So I took it from 13 to 25. I'm curious, Ben, I know we're kind of on the spot doing a podcast, but did you see any shift in your heart rate variability? Yeah. So um, first of all, it felt nice and relaxing. Uh, my start HRV was 15, ended at 35. So it was um, a 130%, 133% increase. Peak HRV was 53. And um, it's given me some other data here, but yeah, that's pretty cool. And then yeah. I'm seeing graphic, those charts right there. And I love it, man. But just think about that. In 60 seconds, you communicated to your nervous system to regulate itself. And you increased it by, what did you say, 100 and how many percent? 133% like, that's in a minute. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you can see that like you did, a, you basically what you did was a resonance breathing breath work practice, but you had the objective data there, which is really important because a lot of people will do a breath work session and they'll say, yeah, that felt really good. But the great thing this is, is that you see the data change across this period of time, then it resonates with people's brains. It conditions them to say, oh my goodness, that was not just me subjectively experiencing a change. Uh, in my nervous system, like I see it and it gets people to come back for more because now it's essentially been gamified. I have evidence that there is change in my nervous system. I increased heart rate variability by, you know, said number of points, you know, over 150% in 60 seconds. Like that's an incredible mechanism for just tapping into the nervous system, uh, you know, in, in any given time. And it's there for you at any given time. That's super cool, especially if you're somebody who tends to get stressed out from whatever relationship, job, whatever is happening in the world. Having this free tool, essentially like breathwork, um, available to do that in a minute or what, whatever length you want to do it for. There's a whole bunch of different breathwork um, styles here. You have the resonance, the box breathing. Is there a? I see relax, calm, sleep. I see routine. So pre meal. What is the what? Is, so this is interesting because I know that digestion. So many people have digestive issues. They have acid reflux, they have GERD, they, 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 they feel bloated. And it's really because they're in this sympathetic state. They're on the go, they're walking and eating. So you have something here called pre-meal and that's a, a, to activate the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic. And that uh, is breath work as well that you do before you have a meal to help you digest it better. Yeah, it's a biofeedback session that we created to help stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve prior to a meal. I, uh, I've read so much great research on this, but also on the Hanu Health podcast, so I can shamelessly plug our podcast. Yeah, um, we had Dr. Stephen Cabral, who's a, who's a wonderful individual in the, the functional medicine uh, space. And one of the things that he said that resonated with me is this idea that if we go in to a meal and we're eating in a sympathetically driven state, well, obviously that is going to shut down digestion. And then in turn, what that's going to end up do is it's going to allow that food to sit in the GI tract and ferment. It's going to cause immense dysbiosis and dysregulation of the gut. So what we need to do is prime the parasympathetic nervous system because that is the branch of our nervous system that is going to aid in digestion, is going to kickstart digestion. We want to do that prior to us eating. So what we tell people is just doing a very short practice, 60 seconds to two minutes really max of a, of a breathwork session that we call pre-meal. And we also do it post-meal in order to start that process. Because so many people, especially us Americans, we're quick on the go. We eat really quickly. We stuff food in our face and we're off to the next thing. And we never have that time to aid in digestion and it can cause significant concerns. The other thing that we found too, is that when people do this type of breath work or biofeedback session prior to a meal, we actually find that two things occur, that the meal does not have nearly as much of an influ influence on them metabolically. So we do not see significant amounts of blood sugar rises like we would with eating in a sympathetic state. So that's one key component. And then the second key component is that heart rate variability suppression after a meal does not last nearly as long. We actually see people's nervous system recover quickly because we do, like when someone eats food, we're going to see an increased heart rate because the gut has to work really hard to digest the meal. So we need both branches, your sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, both actively engaging, them both working together as complements. That is what aids in digestion. But what we don't need to see is a parasympathetic withdrawal, a sympathetic engagement, 
and then more sympathetic engagement because of the immense amount of energy it takes to digest, that is really problematic and leads to GI distress and a lot of gut fermentation because the food just sits there and then makes you constipated and then causes dysbiosis and a lot of other concerns. So it is imperative, in my humble opinion, to do something that is parasympathetically stimulating or it stimulates our vagus nerve prior to eating a meal. And I would also argue after a meal. But it, the great thing is it doesn't need to be long, just a minute to two minutes. That is fascinating. So I have a question on that postprandial glucose because so many people are seeking to have a healthy postprandial glucose or taking berberine. Some people are taking metformin. They're going for walks after a meal. And yeah, some of those could be great. But you said you've seen a better response with postprandial glucose by practicing this breath work, activating the parasympathetic nervous system. What, 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 what kind of testing did you do? What were you doing here? Yeah, so we've done uh, multiple tests looking at CG, wearing CGMs, wearing Levels Health. We've also done it with NutriSense as well. So it's not like we have you know a partnership or collaboration with one company or another. It can be used with any CGM. And the thing that we're looking at is postprandial, so an hour and a half to two hours after the meal. Like, are we having better stimulation um, of of the parasympathetic nervous system by measuring the proxy of heart rate variability, as well as better st uh, stabilization of blood glucose and reducing kind of the immense spike, but also drop within that time frame when using kind of our device, um, not just for monitoring, but for also engaging the nervous system through breath work as opposed to not. And what we see typically is that there are significant, uh, there's the significant ability to stabilize blood sugar in a more efficient manner when people have a regulated nervous system. So if HRV is more regulated, then we see more regulated blood glucose postprandial as opposed to those who kind of enter in with a suppressed heart rate variability indicating higher stress state and then eat them eat even the same meal. It doesn't have to be a meal that would cause significant dysregulation of glucose. It's just simply going in at a more sympathetically driven state. We see that having worse metabolic outcomes than those who actually prime the pump, if you will. Makes sense. It's fascinating. So I have a couple more questions on the device. For those listening and watching, if you want to get your hands on one of these Hanu Health um, HRV, uh, it's essentially a continuous HRV monitor, like a continuous glucose monitor. It's hanuhealth.com. So H-A-N-U health.com. And uh, he, you, you hooked us up. Jay hooked us up with a great coupon code for 20% off your device uh, with the coupon code KETOCAMP, CAMP with the K. So you could check that out. We'll drop a link for that down below. Question for you with the device, Jay, is do I wear this when I go to bed too, even though I have my aura or is this something I take off? Like how often should I be wearing my device? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because it's one that's asked a lot. Um, so obviously our device um, is a, it's an ECG. So it is looking at the electrical output of the heart. It's not an indirect way of measuring heart rate. It is a direct way of measuring heart rate. Whereas Aura, you know, Whoop, a lot of these other bands that people wear, as you, if you look at them, they use lights and that's had actually what's pulling in kind of heart rate. So basically we call it photoplasmography or PPG technology. It's shining a light um, into the capillaries and looking at the expansion and contraction, then therefore we can pick up a pulse rate. Now, during the daytime, uh, so I should say, excuse me, during the nighttime, when you're very still, essentially when the body is, is not moving because you're basically basically paralyzed because you're sleeping, we can get really good data from Aura, from Whoop, from a lot of these devices in regards to heart rate variability. Like I trust these devices regarding heart rate variability. But when you start moving throughout the day, then other things like movement, light, they introduce what's called noise to data. And so the noise or the artifacts are really hard to remove. We can still approximate heart rate pretty well with these devices, but heart rate variability is very very difficult because we have to be very precise because we, if we're off by a matter of a few milliseconds, then we can significantly skew all of the data. So we have to be precise. That is my long-winded way of saying that during the daytime, it is really effective to have an ECG on, so the Hanu device. During nighttime, the data that you're getting from other wearables are really good. And so what I tell people is wear Hanu during your working day. That's your most stressful part of your day. So if it's an eight to five job or a, you know, whatever, nine to five, nine to six, put it on during that time. 
And then after that time, I don't see a ton of need for wear um, because what we really want to do again is monitor you throughout the most stressful parts of your day, help you to train your nervous system during those times. And then uh, at sleep, which is obviously vitally important, like there's not a need to wear Hanu because we're getting really good data from the other devices. So yeah, for me, like for instance, I put mine generally on around seven or eight in the morning, uh, maybe sometimes a little bit earlier. And then I take mine off around five or six in the, in the, in the evening or afternoon. And then I use, you know, Aura and Whoop. I've got everything on that. because I'm always <laughs> testing and I'm a data nerd. Yeah. And so, so for me, like I'll use those devices overnight um, to look at sleep scores. Okay. That makes sense. So what if I'm, do I wear the device when I'm exercising? Cause I see there's a button here for train. How do I, how do I use the strap for my workouts and, and basketball strength training, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is great. Um, because I have, I have a lot to say, but I'll try to truncate it as much as I can. So yes, you can absolutely wear this like basically under every condition. So I wear mine when I work out, I wear mine in the sauna, I wear mine in the cold plunge. I have put it through the ringer and it holds up because it's just a hardcore device. The great thing too, is you don't have to charge the device. It lasts 400 to 450 hours. And whenever the battery dies in it, you just pop it off. There's a single cell like watch battery that you can replace for like a buck 25, you know, off Amazon and you're on your way again. So the great thing is, is you don't have to worry. Oh man, did I not charge it? No, you just throw it on. And when the battery's done, it's done. Now for workouts, what I do is I do a couple of things. One is I'll use it to monitor like really accurate heart rate. Like you're not going to get any more uh, higher level of fidelity and accuracy than you will with this ECG. So you're going to get really accurate pinpoint heart rate and heart rate variability during your workout. We're able to tell you what your HRV is during your workout. What I love is that in between working sets, so let's say if I'm doing resistance training or workout training, the best thing that we can possibly do is allow the nervous system to recover via our own training. So instead of getting on the phone and scrolling emails or Facebook or work, I tell people this is the opportune time to regulate your nervous system, watch your heart rate rate variability raise, and then actively recover in between your working set. And I've got a lot of my clients doing that because, you know, I actually see people um, via Hanu. We have a consulting arm where I see people who want kind of like that extra level of coaching and accountability and care. So I'd love for people, if anybody's interested, you can come work directly with me. But one of the things that I, I tell people all the time is that like actively regulating the nervous system during working sets or in between working sets during rest is extremely valuable. And you're going to see that the duration and the intensity of your workout will be increased because you're actively working to recover. So I love using it for that. And then again, it's just like, if you need a heart rate monitor that is super accurate, like that's what you're going to get with this. And you can hook this one up actually to other apps as well. Like it doesn't just have to be on Hanu, but obviously you can track HRV continuously and you can track heart rate continuously with our app. Got it. How much is your device, by the way, in case somebody's uh, wondering... Yeah, so it's it's two ninety nine, um, which gives you um, access to the platform, and also you get the device. And uh, but with the twenty percent off, I think it takes it around to like two forty or so. So two hundred and forty dollars um, for you know what we say is it's a path to mental wellness that's powered by science. Um, so the whole idea is that we're really trying to enhance people's mental well being, nervous system regulation. And for $240, you know, it's about the cost of like a therapy session nowadays. And we say too, if you're in a therapy session, like it's a great adjunctive to therapy. We have a ton for of sure. therapists who have their clientele on these and it helps them to kind of bridge the gap between sessions. So we think it's a really great add on if people are like, yeah, I'm in a mental health, um, you know, therapy, I'm doing, I'm seeing a therapist or a counselor. This is a great way to kind of um, bridge the gap in between sessions and work on nervous system regulation. Fantastic. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's actually less than the aura ring, especially with the discounts. That's terrific. Is there any concern with EMF, EMFs and wearing it all day long? Yeah, it's, it's a great question that a lot of people pose um, and, and it's understandable. So this is a extremely low emitting um, EMF device. So it obviously is hooked up via Bluetooth to the phone. So if that is a consideration that people are making, like you are going to get like that level of exposure, but it's very minimal compared to things like, you know, AirPods or, or you know, your cell phone or other avenues. 
But what we tell people again is like, you know, take breaks from it. I mean, for me, it's like I'll wear it throughout the working day and then take it off. And then like sometimes, like especially during non-stressful periods, like the weekends, like I might just take a full break from it. Or if I put it on, I'll put it on for like a biofeedback session that may last five, 10 minutes and then take it off. So, you know, use it judiciously. Um, but I, what, one of the things that we wanted to do is get something that was extremely low EMF emitting, which Polar has made. I mean, it's a tiny device, as you can see, like it's, it comes with a strap, but the device itself is super tiny. And the amount of, uh, we, we've actually toned down kind of the signal ratio so that like, if you are transmitting to the phone like we don't have it to where it will work like you know 70 or 90 feet away like it will only work within a close proximity just because we wanted to even take a low emf emitting device and turn down basically its volume awesome yeah i'm glad you addressed that because i'm sure that question would have uh, been asked so thank you for sharing that a couple more questions before we wrap this up my my fiance right she has an aura ring as well and she gets ridiculously high HRV scores. And I'm a little bit jealous. And I always ask people because I'm just curious why I know that it's, there's so many variables, there's genetics, there's different things, but she gets like 130, 140 on that aura. And she's not like a professional athlete and she's not somebody who's really good at balancing her nervous system. She actually has, you know, she has panic attacks here and there. So what do you, why, why do you think her HRVs are so freaking high? Yeah, you, you you hit the nail on the head when you use the word genetics. When we look at the HRV studies that have been done, um, they've done familial studies, they've done twin studies. And the one thing that we see is that regardless of someone's health status, we know that a key variable to higher heart rate variability or even lower heart rate variability is the genetic component. So what we've seen in these studies is that there are individuals um, like twin studies where they look at the lifestyle choices and behavioral choices compared to, uh, to each twin. And that variable doesn't even really matter. Their HRVs actually hold a lot closer to one another. <laughs> now there is a threshold for that because we know that as someone increases things like VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness, um, as they reduce inflammation in the body. So as they reduce things like HSCRP, we'll actually see a bump in their baseline heart rate variability. The key component, the most important thing um, then, and you kind of saw this in real time today, is that I am less concerned with where someone's baseline is. I am more concerned with how much their nervous system listens to them when they tell it to, when they talk to it. So you talked to your nervous system earlier and you saw a 154% increase in heart rate variability. It could be, and I've seen this happen plenty of times, that someone may have, let's say, a heart rate variability baseline of 100 but their nervous system won't listen to it. It won't budge when they mm -hmm. tell it to move. It may go up to like 101 or 102. Now, the question then would be, well, whose nervous system is more resilient? Whose would I rather have? And I would take the person who has the lower HRV that can shift it 154% than someone who has one that is higher but can only move it, you know, 1% or even less. So that is kind of my... my uh, I guess you would say diatribe on why the baseline factors, like they're interesting and they give us good information, but I tell people to focus less on kind of what that baseline number is, because again, genetics play a huge factor. Height plays a huge factor, cardiorespiratory fitness, that all those things play as a variable or a factor um, and are important, but I don't want to, so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what I would say is that the most important aspect is how well will your nervous system listen to it when you tell it to do something? Is it the dog that like won't listen and will continue to bark and bark and bark and like run away from you on the leash or you snap your fingers and then immediately it comes down and sits at your, at your, on your lap. So that's, that's the nervous system I'm trying to train. And I'm trying to kind of like more or less preach this idea that yes, it's great if we can increase our own baseline heart rate variability through a lot of the things that I've talked about today, but I would be a lot less concerned with where your number, is um, as opposed to how well can you modulate that number? Understood. So doing that 60 second session and looking at what your nervous system did, where your HRV went, where your heart rate, heart rate went is more important than just the baseline number. So what, what I saw was 133% increase in my HRV in 60 seconds. That would be considered a really good response. My nervous system adapted. What would be what would be like that threshold? What would what would be considered not a good response? If somebody did that and they maybe got like a 12% increase, is that considered not good? 
work to do? So it, 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 we do look at it directionally, right? So if it increases, well, that means that the nervous system, the vagus nerve is listening. So it's, we're seeing a shift and that's a good thing. Like we want to see an upward trend. The one big problem I see for a lot of people, even if they have pretty good resilient nervous systems, is they'll sit down to do a biofeedback session. And when they do, they get really bad performance anxiety. They're trying really hard to yeah. say, I'm, I'm trying to move the needle. And when that happens and they see heart rate variability go down because they're getting amped up and stressed, well, then what does that do? What causes them more anxiety? I'm not doing this right. I need to try harder. And what happens? HRV goes down and down and down. And I tell people, listen, that's a great learning moment, right? That is the, that is the time where you say, oh, goodness, there's something about this practice. There's something about cognitively that's getting in the way and I need to focus and work on that. That's a good thing. Let's work on it. Let's address the deficit that's here and work on it. So we know that any upward direct movement is good because that means that the nervous system is actively engaging. I, mean, I should say more the parasympathetic nervous system, the break is actively engaging. But what we want to do is start to increase that more and more and more over time. So we're, maybe we're only moving at 5% every time we do HRV biofeedback. And now we're seeing, oh, 10%. 50%, 100%, 130%. Like those are the things that we really want to start to see because what that means is that the nervous system is becoming more sensitive to your messaging. The vagus nerve is starting to tune in a little bit more. It says, oh, I like that. Like, let me turn the volume up. And every time I hear you do this or you're trying to actively engage me, I'm going to listen even more because this is great for me, like slowing down the pace of things. Like that really bodes well with me as the vagus nerve. So I, I think it's all about just like working to find where you are and then just actively progress. Just try to get 1% better every single day, just like in every facet of life. That's what this shirt says. Beat yesterday. That's exactly what you're saying right there. That's it, man. <laughs> um, I like that. You know, for, for, for me personally, Jay, having data like that, motivates me, inspires me to like want to improve that because I can see it in front of me. And there's a lot of people like that. So it's cool to have this this tool. I have one more question if you have time. Do you have a couple more minutes? Of course, man. Shoot. Okay. I'm a big fan of um gratitude. I call it vitamin G. I I have seen it change my life and the lives of so many people. What it does, speaking of the parasympathetic nervous system, what it does for GABA, oxytocin, all these amazing neurotransmitters. Have you done any studies on um, somebody getting their daily dose of vitamin G. So practicing gratitude and what it does for HRV. Yeah, there's a great study that's actually been done on this. And one of the things we're including in our application um, here soon is going to be a gratitude journaling feature because we awesome. find so much value. And the other thing um, that we are going to be building in as well is the ability to give and receive gratitude from others, more kind of a communal um, aspect within the application, which I think will be really great as well. But the one thing that we see in, in, in the literature, um, and again, there needs to be more studies, and I hope that here at Hanu we can do a lot more of these studies is that individuals, just the simple practice of sitting down and doing a gratitude journal increases heart rate variability. So them just simply thinking through and writing down, let's say doing something like a five minute journal or just kind of like their own free writing or whatever kind of practice um, it is, as opposed to those who are not doing it, we see individuals significantly raise heart rate variability in that moment. And that is just such a beautiful thing because what that is showing is that during that moment, even aside from kind of us regulating, let's say, our physiology through breathing, what we're seeing is that is tapping into our nervous system's ability to say, this is something that is really good for me. It is safe. It is secure. And so I am a huge advocate of it because of that research, but also because we know that there are so many important aspects of giving and then also receiving gratitude that it, it's like paramount to what I do on a daily basis. And it's paramount to what we're building into Hanu. So I'm glad mm. you brought that up because I think it's an invaluable tool. I love it, man. That is so awesome. You know what I envision, I'm just going to throw it out there. It would be super cool for the app to have like a minute, two minute session of gratitude where there's a voice or some sort of like prompt saying, um, what is something that you can feel that you're grateful for right now? What is something that you could touch? Uh, well, same thing. What is something you could smell that you're grateful for right now? What is a grateful moment you had 
you know, so just having having some prompts to get them there with gratitude and getting them in that practice day. And maybe they could write it down too, but I know you're developing something like that, but that would be super cool. We'll call it vitamin G minute. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There are so many things that we're putting into this app. So just so that everybody is aware too, you know, we're only, we're basically just a little bit over a year old. So we went from like nothing wow. to a product out to the market That's in cool. basically a year, which was nuts. It was really crazy to do. So for us, it's like we built that foundation and now we can add in the components that are based in, uh, in evidence and science. And so one of the big things that we're doing right now is really working on including things like meditations and non-sleep deep breaths, yoga nidra, and then the aspects related to almost like guided gratitude journaling, if you will, or at least guided uh, gratitude thought exercises and meditation. So it's coming, man. And I think it's going to be a really big one for us because the breathwork practices are great. Biofeedback's great, but we also want to add in some of those science-based tools like meditation, you know, NSDR and yoga nidra, and then other gratitude practices and just really kind of throw everything at our mental wellness, everything we possibly can to improve and lead ourselves down the path of joy, peace, and contentment. That's really our mission. Yeah. Super cool. This is something that you could take with you anywhere, right? You could be on an airplane doing this. You could be uh, any on a road trip. So it's super cool. You could take it with you wherever you go. Last question is around gratitude and vitamin G. J. What are you grateful for today? Oh man, I'm, I'm grateful to be on this podcast. Number one, <laughs> thank you for having me. But, you know, the, the thing that is closest to me is my family. Um, you know, as, as a father of two little boys, uh, just every single day that I walk home, uh, or I don't walk home, I drive home, but walk <laughs> into the door and I see just their smiles on their faces and they hug me and they just say how much they're glad to have me home like that to me, like my heart rate variability when that happens, like skyrockets because I just have so much love and care and passion for my two little boys. I love my wife too. She does the same thing, but not as with much, with as much energy as my two boys. <laughs> They're just young little balls of energy. And I'm just so grateful for it every day. Like I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'd give up everything in this world just to have that. So that is the thing that I am most grateful for. What a blessing. That's so beautiful. Um, so hanuhealth.com, keto camp at checkout for 20% off. Anywhere else you want them to go, social media? Yeah, yeah. So on social media, it's at Dr. J. Wiles. I do a lot of educational reels and things on heart rate variability and so forth. And then at Hanu Health, we put a lot of educational stuff on there as well. And then check us out on the Hanu Health podcast. And you can find us on Spotify, you know, iTunes, everywhere else. Um, so we, we, we do a lot of interviews related to mental wellness and to stress resiliency and breath work. So those are the uh, the primary places. Then of course, HanuHealth.com. Make sure you use uh, coupon code KETOCAMP. Get you 20% off. Awesome. We're going to put all that down below. I love that you focus on uh, what I call the mental mental six pack. It's uh, so, so very important. So Jay, I got gratitude for you, man. Thanks for uh, being in this space, for uh, educating us today, for creating such a, a great device that's so practical, so easy to use and easy to understand to help people fine tune the nervous system so we could avoid disease and overcome some of these challenges, not just mentally, but physically. So thank you, my friend. I, I look forward to doing more, having more conversations with you and seeing all the cool things coming to the app. So thank you, brother. I love it, man. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me on.